welcome you tonight to Delaware Christian Fellowship. And um, we are going to start a new series tonight. Actually, it's a new topic in our series on basic Bible fundamentals. And um, we're going to look at the unseen world. Now, for about a year, year and a half, we have been going through a study that I've entitled uh, Basic Bible Fundamentals. And uh, basically, we're covering the basic fundamentals of the historic Christian faith from a Pentecostal or full gospel kind of perspective. Um, we haven't dug in as deep as we have in years past, but we've tried to, as the old time preacher said, try to keep the cookies kind of on the lower shelf and touch on some issues that you may not come across if you're searching for something, maybe on YouTube or something like that. But we're going to start a new topic tonight uh, called The Unseen World. So, uh, Let's go ahead and get started with that. All right. All right, let's get started. I've titled this first session, uh, Seeing the Unseen World. Seeing the Unseen World. Now that sounds a little bit strange, but there are a lot of people who don't really recognize the fact that there is an unseen world, that there is a supernatural, uh, if you will, world that is taking place that is beyond our uh, normal abilities to perceive. And uh, that's why I want to talk tonight about seeing the unseen world. I have broken this study up into five topics. Now, you will remember that typically we do this in four but I want to do five because I wanted to use this first session to sort of launch uh, into this great topic. Now, uh, for any of you who are familiar with these types of things, you would know that it would take years and years and years to even begin to exhaust this sub subject. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are books just, for example, just on the various names of, of demons or of uh, um, false gods and things in the Old Testament. There are scholarly works that are a thousand pages long. Um, so, I mean, that's just for starters. And um, there are many things we could talk about, but I've broken this up into five studies. Again, tonight, seeing the unseen world. And next week, I would like to talk about angelology. Now, uh, that's that's kind of a tricky word to use, and we're going to find that out next week. There are a lot of different um, uh, ways that the word can be defined, and there are Greek words and Hebrew words that we need to look at. Demonology, we're going to talk about demons. What are demons? Where do demons come from? Uh, and we're going to look at that. And we're going to talk about principalities and powers. And these, of course, are the ruling kind of uh, powers that are over the nations that we find throughout Scripture. And then the last session I've titled The Finality of the Rebellion. Of course, you will know that the enemy, the devil, Lucifer, uh, fell and he drew away a number of, of angels uh, or, or supernatural beings, as I like to call them, um, with him. And they are leading a rebellion against God. And we're going to talk about that. Our golden text review tonight is just so that we can sort of launch from what we've been talking about over the last several weeks in talking about the church. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Okay, and I'm not going to read the rest, but um, the Catholics use this verse to suggest, of course, as we know, that Peter was effectively the first pope and that he had the authority or the keys, if you will, that were given to him uh, that represent authority and that they have been passed down unto this day to each pope. However, that the passage is saying something quite different than that, especially if you look at it uh, within its historical setting. Now, I want you to notice something about this verse, and we didn't talk about this over the last several weeks, and that is the gates of Hades, okay? The gates, of course, of anything are 
defensive in nature. They're not offensive. Uh, you don't go to war with gates as an offensive weapon. Um, gates are a defensive weapon. You put gates around something to protect it from people getting in or maybe from people getting out or, or maybe animals or, or other things. But nevertheless, gates are defensive in nature. So when we think about the historical setting of this event, okay, it was situated where Jesus is talking, the very spot where he was talking, was in an area around Mount Hermon. Now, for those of you who are kind of familiar with these things historically, you will know that this was an area of demonic activity where it's believed that certain of the angels, if you will, uh, came down and, and a lot of trouble started, uh, and, well, continued, but uh, really ramped up for the human race. So it's very fitting that the Lord would choose this spot to make this uh, proclamation to Peter. Uh, of course, this place was also known as, as a rock. So um, you could say in a, in, a, in a sense that the Lord is speaking both to Peter and the very spot uh, where he was sitting when he was talking about uh, the rock that he was going to build uh, the church upon. Um, the objective of the kingdom of God, understand, is not, as the old song says, to hold the fort, but it is, as it were, to breach the gates of Hades, or the gates of he hell, through the preaching of the gospel. Now, I want you to think about uh, things in terms of people that are under the authority of Satan. They're under the authority of the devil. And what do they do? They are they are taken captive at his will. They are in bondage to Satan, okay? And Paul, and we'll see this a little more later, was given the commission to turn the people from darkness to light, from the power or the authority of Satan to God. And um, what he ultimately was doing was preaching deliverance to the captives. They were going to come out uh, of Satan's domain. They were going to come into the Lord's domain. So what this passage is really saying, and I think that many scholars would agree with this, is that the gates of Hades are in effect, okay, what is representative of this reality, okay? And they are not going to prevail against the church. The church is going to prevail against them. In other words, the church is going to breach these gates, okay, and begin bringing people out, deliverance. You'll remember uh, that John the Baptist, when he was uh, called to preach, that he was, the, the scripture said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Well, the breaker is going out, uh, is going out. This is a passage, I believe it's in Malachi. The breaker is going out, and it's like opening up the pasture, and the sheep are going out, and the shepherd is uh, leading them, as it were, they are following. And this is sort of the picture. But as Paul put it, again, in Acts chapter 26, he has been given the commission to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan and to the power of God. And Jesus said very clearly, the gates of Hades are not going to prevail. Okay, the church is going to be successful. Now, over the next several weeks, I want to use Ephesians 6 verse 12 as our golden text. It's a very familiar passage. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And some translations say, in the heavenly realms. See, we are in a battle. And we're going to look at this word wrestle in just a minute. We are in a battle. We are in a spiritual battle, okay? This is not a black battle with flesh and blood. Despite everything that you see going on in the world that is being reported upon, and yes, there are a lot of human actors that are going on, but there is also a spiritual element that is happening uh, in the world that we are living in, and it's important that we recognize that. Now, I want to just bring to your attention a few things in regards to the under, uh, unseen world, because a, a lot of people have this view that there isn't any such thing as the supernatural. There isn't any such thing. You remember the Sadducees, they didn't believe in afterlife. 
They didn't believe in angels or anything like that. Okay, so you can be religious and still not believe in the supernatural because we already know, again, that that was the case with the Sadducees. But I want to read Hebrews 11, verse 3, a very famous uh, scripture verse. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. Now, we know that God is invisible. He created the visible world, that is, the world that we experience, the world that we can uh, interact with, things that we can see, things we can touch, things that we can comprehend and understand. He created the entire framework of our experience, okay? Everything related to it, including the laws of physics, all of this were created by God, okay? Because God is a spirit, and God doesn't have a material body unless he decides to take on human flesh, of course. Uh, this is also true of supernatural beings. Now, when I say supernatural beings, I'm referring to the beings that God created that we cannot see with our eyes again unless they manifest themselves in some kind of way that we can visibly see or unless God were to reveal them to us in a dream or something like that, okay, we cannot see them. God has created them. He has created these beings. Now, we sometimes throw the word angels out there kind of kind of loosely. That word just really kind of means messenger. We're going to look at that next week. But um, the bottom line is God has created these supernatural beings and even orders of these beings, okay? And they are all his creation. And you'll remember in Job chapter 38 where the Bible talks about uh, the sons of God and it talks about how, I believe it is the morning stars saying together, this is a picture of the angels uh, rejoicing when God created uh, the heavens and the earth and he created the world in which we live. Now he created it basically with three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And this is our experience. We can't comprehend a second dimension of time, though we can calculate things mathematically. We can look at it from that point of view, but we can't understand four dimensions or five dimensions or multiple dimensions or multiple dimensions of time. We can't comprehend them, okay? But nevertheless, they could exist. We don't know. God could have a completely different way of doing things when it comes to um, the unseen world. We just don't know. We don't have that information. We just know what our experience is based upon the way that God has created us. Okay, He is, Colossians 1 verse 15 and 16, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, talking about Jesus Christ. For by him all things were created. You see that? He created all things that are in heaven, that are on earth, whether they're visible or invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Okay, so you say, well, was God responsible? Was the Lord responsible for the fall? Was he responsible for the rebellion? No, not at all. But nevertheless, God is the creator. He is the one who is the supreme authority and has the supreme power. If anything has power, if anything has the ability to interact, it doesn't have it of its own self. It received that power or ability from God. If it has knowledge or wisdom, it received that from God. If it has capability, if it has animation, you name it, uh, it received it from God because God is the creator and he is all powerful. Now, sometimes we refer to these supernatural beings as gods. Okay, we're going to do that throughout this series. And when I say gods, I mean God's little g. Um, we, you, you see this word in the Old Testament, El Elohim. Okay, and um, oftentimes what this is talking about, or when we're talking about gods, when God said, you will have no other gods before me, we're talking about people who are worshiping the host of heaven. Again, these created beings that God has created that have fallen, okay? And they are trying to divide the worship between God and them. They're trying to pull the worship, pull 
the authority over to themselves, okay, uh, and things like that. And there's a lot more that I could say along that line. But when we're talking about gods, we're talking about um, demonic forces, okay, that have or demonic beings that are are um, are part of the fall or the rebellion. By faith, he, that being Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. You see, the expectation of the children of Israel, and not just them, as we're going to see in a moment, but pagans as well, their entire, entire worldview, okay, it was supernatural. They expected there to be supernatural things happening. I think about just right here in uh, the United States, or, or even in Central America, and even in South America, you have all of these kind of mounds, very similar to the pyramids, that uh, you have these elevated platforms. You even have them here in Cahokia, Illinois, which is just on the other side of Springfield, I'm sorry, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and these places were where people would go to worship other gods. You'll remember in Romans chapter 1, the people did not like to retain God in their net knowledge, but rather they wanted to worship the creature rather than the creator. So what did they do? They made gods that were made out of stone or of gold or whatever they had made of, stuff they had tooled with uh, their own hands, okay? But back of these, according to Paul in Corinthians, were demons, okay? They were sacrificing to demons and all of that. And they understood this. I mean, it wasn't as though they didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't think that they were really bowing down to just a picture. They knew that that was representative of a, of a, of a force or a demonic spirit that was back of that. And uh, so there was a supernatural worldview, not just in Israel, not just among the pagans in the Middle East, but really all over the world. Now this word, wrestle, when we talk about um, the unseen world in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, is a Greek word, pala, pala or pele, and it means to wrestle, which was an ancient game where men would try to throw one another to get them on the ground so that they could put them in a chokehold and force them into submission. Now, what Paul is saying is that we are wrestling, not with flesh and blood, but we're wrestling with principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this age. And we're going to talk about those over the next several weeks against spiritual hosts of wickedness. What's their intention? Okay. What is the objective? Okay. When we're engaged in a struggle, it is for our very soul. The enemy, of course, because Paul is writing to Christians in Ephesians chapter 6, the enemy, Paul is saying, is trying to destroy us, okay? He is trying to get us to renounce our faith, to turn back to the enemy, to turn back to the powers of darkness, to turn back under the authority of the devil. And that's why Paul said to take the whole armor of God, okay? Sometimes people have a doctrinal view that, well, we can never be lost. We don't have to worry about anything. Well, that's hard to comprehend when you consider that he tells you to take on the full armor of God. You don't need armor if you can't be killed or wounded. You have that armor to protect you from in mortal combat. Um, that's the purpose, okay? These weren't like the, the knee coverings that athletes put on their knees or elbow pads or anything like that. This was for mortal combat. And that's what Satan wants. He wants to reverse the work that God started and is doing in the lives of in individuals who he is bringing uh, many sons and daughters unto glory. He's trying to get us to turn back to, to the enemy and uh, to be lost for all of eternity. 1 John 3, 8, a very popular passage of scripture. The second portion of it said, the, this is the reason that the Son of God appeared, and it was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, when the devil, uh, Lucifer, as we know him, that old serpent, the dragon, as the book of Revelation refers to him by his many names in a sequence, what he ultimately has caused is tremendous havoc. He has caused all kinds of defilement, not just on earth, but in heaven. And when Jesus died on the cross, 
he took care of that. And he is in the process now of destroying the works of the devil and bringing all under his feet. That is to say, underneath of his dominion and authority. And we're going to talk about that more over the next several weeks. But again, just wanting to focus on seeing the unseen world. The people of Israel, again, the pagans of the land, all had a supernatural worldview. We know this because of the many writings that we have that are extra-biblical writings. We would sometimes call them non-canonical canonical writings, meaning that they don't measure up to the authority to be placed in the canon. But nevertheless, they're historical. We have a lot of documents that were discovered in the Qumran Caves, which we've come to know today as the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. There are many, many other documents like that. There are tablets that have been found, even like in the last 10 years, tons of documentation going back into antiquity that sheds light on the fact that the world, by and large, has always had a supernatural worldview. They did not live in a time that they viewed science as the answer to all their questions. This is a modern invention. This is something that's only happened since the outlook, uh, since the Enlightenment. Today, the outlook says, follow the science. We hear it on television, you know, but it's interesting, and I, and I believe uh, that science has its place. It certainly does. I believe in uh, doing things that are uh, scientific and things like that, and that's important, but it's not the answer to everything. For example, you'll remember that the Lord Jesus many times, okay, he would cast a demon out of a person who had some kind of infirmity or sickness or problem that today science would diagnose and probably give them a pill. They would probably give them some kind of counseling, some kind of therapy or something of that nature, whereas the problem was really demonic, okay, in origin, okay? It wasn't just something that you could you could just cure by own uh, by natural means. You say, well, what happened? Well, though the world went through this entire period where they were always uh, looking at everything with a supernatural worldview, the Enlightenment of the 16th to the 18th century included a range of ideas that centered on the sovereignty of reason. Okay, and the evidence of the senses as the primary source of knowledge. In other words, we have to learn by observation. We have to be able to test it in the laboratory. Okay, it's got to be able to make sense in terms of reason and things like that. And there's a place for all these things. I'm not disparaging that. But what the Enlightenment truly did what it was that it cast a shadow on a tremendous amount of truth in regards to the unseen world. Okay, because it basically discounted that. Okay, it set aside the, the, thing that, the thing that we know is true, that God has created the universe, try to replace Darwinian evolution with that, okay, and just all these different things. The Enlightenment was marked by an emphasis on the scientific method, reductionism, of course, along with questioning religious orthodoxy. And there's a reason why that happened. There's there was an environment and a historical context for the Enlightenment coming about. And I wrote about that a little bit in Televangelicalism. But nevertheless, you say, what happened? Well, we end up in a world today that views things almost exclusively through a lens that says God doesn't exist, the supernatural doesn't exist, and the only thing that exists are the laws of nature, the laws of physics, and of course, the world that we are able to observe with our own eyes, we can check it out and, and test it in a test tube or in a laboratory, or we can come up with some kind of theory to explain uh, certain realities. But there are a great number, and when I say great, a huge number of questions and things that we deal with in life that cannot be answered with natural answers. And what the world has tried to do was substitute natural answers for supernatural answers and to try to, you know, use natural means to deal with supernatural issues. And there's so much more I could say along that line. Indeed, in ancient times, there were both superstition and confusion. I don't deny this fact. There was a lot of superstition. There was a lot of stuff that needed to be weeded out. There isn't any question about it. 
But what they effectively did is they just, as the old timer would say, poured, took, took and poured the baby out with the bath water and they got rid of everything. So-called science has always sought again to give natural answers to everything, including answers that require supernatural answers. And um, I think it's important to understand. When I was a young Christian, I just want to tell you this story. When I was a young Christian, as a matter of fact, when I was first studying to teach basic Bible fundamentals in the late 90s, we didn't have the internet in those days. We didn't have a way to go online and do research and studies like that. You had to actually go to libraries and do the research. So I studied at various places like Nazarene Theological Seminary, St. Paul's Theological Seminary. But on this particular occasion, on a Sunday afternoon, I decided to go up to the Trails West uh, local um, library, uh, which is a pretty nice library. And I went in and I gathered up some books that I was doing some research on some topics for. And I looked across the table, and these were very large tables where we were sitting, and the gentleman had a large uh, document that he was editing. I mean, this thing was printed out on like a big plotter, okay? I'm talking sheets that were massive, okay? And I was looking at what he was doing, and I noticed that it said copyright like 1998. Well, this was like 1997. So it was like the following year, and I was really curious, and I noticed he had a red pen, and he was circling and he was drawing a line and he was making notations on the side and being the curious person that I often am, I couldn't help myself. I said, sir, I said, would you mind me, me asking, what are you doing? And he said, he said, well, he said, you know, I am a re retired high school uh, science teacher. And, and if I called the high school name, those here in Kansas City would immediately know the high school, but I'm going to protect this man's identity. He also, once he retired, became a, an instructor at one of the local community college. But he said, I'm a retired high school uh, science teacher, and I also work for Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston as an editor for their science textbooks. This really piqued my interest. We were sitting near a window at the time I was doing actual studies on Darwinian evolution and, and uh, Christian apologetics along that line. And I remember looking at him and I pointed out the window. I said, sir, can I ask you a question? I said, do you believe that all of this here got here by accident? And he says to me, and I was shocked. He said, no. He said, I believe God created it all. I just don't know how he did it. And at this point, I'm blown completely away. Here is a man who is editing a science book as a science teacher in high school who has taught 25 or more years in high school, undoubtedly Darwinian evolution, but did not even believe the very things that he was teaching or to the next generation that he was going to leave them with the textbook to, to learn from. As a matter of fact, he said, I was in church this morning. Now, as a young Christian, that really took me by storm, if you will. That really threw me. Because here I was trying to teach one Sunday per week that God created everything, that God is the creator and all these different things. And he's going to school and went to school for 25 years, teaching kids every day things contrary to his own conscience. I thought to myself, how could I in a day possibly undo what this man is doing. I mean, I felt, I felt so incapable at that moment. But God marked my steps, and he made sure that I saw this man so that I was aware that we have teachers 
We have people who are even editing the books that our children in high school are reading who don't even believe the very things that they're trying to indoctrinate the children with. And I suggest to you that that is one of the most demonic and diabolical things that could possibly happen, to corrupt the minds of children when they're young, to participate in that. I have often thought since that time, I would not want to be that man on Judgment Day. Could you imagine being that man on Judgment Day? But see, this is what's happening. This is what's happening in the school systems. This is what's happening in the public schools. This is what's happening in our secular colleges. Think about that. It's politically incorrect to say anything other than something that would have spawned from the Enlightenment. And that's the thing that we're dealing with today. And that's one of the reasons why people don't believe in the unseen world. You have people who are using their, using their influence to influence children. That's one of the reasons why I worked my hardest to make sure that my children did not go to secular school if I could avoid it. I tried to keep them in private schools. I did have two of my sons that graduated from secular school and two from private. And, and my daughters, of course, went to secular school as well. But it's just, dis, it's just disheartening, but I digress. I just wanted to share that with you so you're aware that this is the type of thing that is happening. The unseen world, context is everything. What lens, I'm going to ask this question, are you reading the Bible through? What lens? You say, Brother Robert, what do you mean? Well, when I put on a pair of glasses, okay, if I put on shooter's glasses or if I put on sunglasses, those lenses are going to impact the way I see things. These are reader's glasses. They help me read. They amplify what I'm seeing. But what happens when we are looking at the Word of God through the lens of a particular doctrinal point of view or a theological point of view, okay? What about a scientific lens, a scientific point of view? What about a cultural point of view or a cultural lens, okay? We don't see things like the first century saints. Now, if you go back and you and you look at these things, I remember as a young Christian, one of the things that I wanted to do, because I recognized this all early on, is I wanted to study the history of the period around the time of Jesus. And I didn't understand the terminologies at the time, but what I eventually did was I made a study of the second temple period. This would be the time from when the temple that was Zerubbabel's temple that was rebuilt after the Babylonians destroyed uh, Solomon's temple. The Zer temple of Zerubbabel was rebuilt, eventually became Herod's temple. But nevertheless, from the return from Babylon, okay, up until AD 170 or AD 135, which would be the second Jewish revolt, the first and second Jewish revolt, that period of time, the second temple period, where that second temple existed, what did people believe? What was their expectation? What did they think about things like the mess messianic concepts, uh, okay, or the, the, the idea of a Messiah coming? What was the historical framework? So I spent a number of years studying at the Messianic Institute uh, uh, here in Kansas City, and it later became known as the Jewish Roots Institute. Now, I want to just say, I do not believe in rabbinical Judaism. I believe rabbinical Judaism is antichrist from the word go. So I do not believe in that. And I don't believe it has really much to contribute at all, if anything, to today. But that is not true if you look back to the second temple period before the rise of the Pharisees and ultimately uh, beyond the rise of the Pharisees when they fled to Jamnia or Yavne and they started rabbinical Judaism. Before that time, what did people believe? What was the culture like? Okay, he said, well, we learn these things again from studying the Qumran text, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We learn it from lots of different 
non-canonical books, okay? These, are, again, are books that didn't measure up. They're not canonical, but they have good information Some in some cases that can be helpful, that can sort of give us a historical context for what people believed, okay? So we know from these things that they were supernatural. They expected to see angels. They expected to see God communicating with his people supernaturally. It wasn't unusual at all to hear an audible voice from heaven, for example, that they called a bot call. So there are many things we could say along that line. But what has happened to the churches and to Christians, okay, and people who are serious students of the Bible, is that rather than reading the Bible as the first century saints would hear it, that would be the people that Paul wrote to, Peter wrote to, John wrote to, Luke wrote to, so as they would hear it, okay, they're hearing it or they're seeing it through the lens of Augustine, John Calvin, Jacobus Arminius, John Wesley, Charles Finney, and a host of others, Jonathan Edwards. So you have this framework of ideas. You have this entire thing that's been built, okay, that's now being sort of superimposed upon the scriptures so that when people read the Bible, they are reading it through the lens of Augustinian theology. They're reading it through the lens of government of God. They're reading it through the lens of predestination. All of these things are additions to the text, okay? All of these things are added layers to the text that keep us from understanding things the way we ought. Now, in modern times, when you talk about the unseen world, it's not unusual to have a lot of people who've studied the topic, okay, in charismatic or Pentecostal type cir circles. But where you have people who are cessationists, meaning that they believe that the operation of the Holy Spirit, as we see it taking place in the book of Acts, chapter you know, 12, 13, 14, ceased. It ended. Miracles are over. By and large, all these different things, okay? They're cessationists. They typically don't have a view of the supernatural the way that um, you would have in the first century. They simply do not. And the historical documentation proves this fact. And even people who are cessationists, who are uh, scholars, will acknowledge this fact. So it's important that we identify before we even start talking about the unseen realm. What are our theological, what are our scientific, and what are our cultural, I don't want to say biases, what are those lenses that we are looking through that are coloring these things, okay? They have to be stripped away, and I want to show you an illustration of what I mean by that. In order to properly understand the Bible, all those lenses must come off. We must ask ourselves, what was the historical context of the writings? What did the original hearers of those words understand? And if we can understand what they should have understood, then that'll help us understand how we can apply it today. Now, again, I just want to show you an illustration here. I have the word truth in the middle of our whiteboard, and I want to show you what it's like when you begin to add things like theological. Now we've got a theological lens that we've placed over the Word of God. Okay, now we're going to add perhaps a cultural lens over the Word of God. You see what it's doing? It's slowly obscuring the truth. Now we're going to add scientific. What is it? Well, we, we had a teacher like that gentleman that was uh, editing for Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston and just really laying it on for the children. Didn't even believe it himself. But he's going to come teach it to the kids so that their truth is being going to be obscured when they go to study and read the Bible. They're going to question what it means. They're going to doubt it. They're going to say, well, you know, there isn't anything uh, true in the historical nature of Genesis chapter 1 two and three, and all these things. Why is it happening? Because that lens is now over it. But there's another lens, if you will, that is perhaps the most dangerous of all, and that is the lens of compromise. The lens of compromise. 
When we entertain compromise, when we refuse to agree with God, when he has said things to us very clearly, okay, when we don't agree with God as it relates to various types of sins, especially, and this is one of the things that I want to talk about, and that is mind-altering drugs. Did you know that mind-altering drugs are becoming more and more accepted in society today? The old saying and the mockery, I can almost hear it. Oh, Brother Robert, I can hear you now. It's going to be a slippery slope from marijuana to LSD. Well, it probably will be. It almost certainly is going to be. But here's the thing. We're going to find this out in this study, and I'm going to show you how that in ancient times, there was a direct connection between taking drugs that were mind-altering and the demonic. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, neither did the people in the book of Revelation. And that's why a lot of them are going to be destroyed. But what happens when you want to have darkness, when you want to have compromise? That's what Jesus said. Paul, turn him from darkness to light. We talked about it last night. What is darkness? Darkness is when you want to be in a place where you're not being contested for the things you want to do. You don't want to be challenged. You don't want light to be shining on you. That is truth. You want to hide out in the darkness. You want to hide out in the shadows. You don't want anyone challenging you. Your sexual sin, you don't want... As a matter of fact, today, it, it's, it's going to eventually be criminal to even talk about sexual sin. As I talked about last week, they're even starting to promote pedophilia. It's eventually going to become, if we stay on this traje trajectory, it's going to become a lifestyle choice, or it's going to be, oh, I was born that way. Then they're going to have another letter added to the LGBT. There's going to be another one added to it. Why is it? It's because people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. And when you have this mentality that you don't want the light of truth, Look what you're doing to truth. Look at how obscured the word truth is now because you have people who refuse to reckon with this fact. We have to agree with God. When you agree with God, when you finally decide to agree with God, let me show you what it's going to do to truth in your eyes. Look how that just cleared up. What's going to happen when you decide, you know what, I'm not going to try to look at society through cultural eyes. So what do you mean by like, well, here in America, we have the view that we're never going to be persecuted as Christians and Christians don't get persecuted. As a matter of fact, God's going to take the church out before any persecution really happens. I mean, this has been the basic doctrine since I was a child. Well, it doesn't work very well in North Korea. It doesn't work very well in China doesn't work very well in Iran. It works real good here where we're safe and sound, but it's becoming more dangerous in America to become a Christian. But this is just one example, okay, how your culture can be imposed upon the Word of God and color the way you view the Scriptures. You think everybody should be rich. Everybody should have wealth and all these different types of things. Well, you wouldn't believe that if you lived in certain places in Africa, okay? And, and that's just important. So what do we need to do? We need to get rid again of the cultural uh, bias, the cultural influence. The next thing, the scientific side. Again, I already mentioned how the gentleman uh, had skewed teaching by, by editing books and science books that were going to be taught to children. You know, that needs to be taken away. And we need to agree with God. What happens? It unobscures the truth. And then finally, the doctrinal and even the, I should say, the um, theological persuasion, persuasions and bents that people have. As a matter of fact, they're proud of the fact that they're Arminian. They're proud of the fact that they're governor of God. They're proud of the fact that they're Calvinist. And oh, and everyone else, you know, they don't really have the truth, and we're really up here on our, on our pedestal. Well, not really, because the fact of the matter is, those concepts, concepts would have been very foreign to the people who first received the New Testament. They would probably ask you, what are you talking about? 
That is not at all what I was trying to say. That's what Paul would probably say to people. Where did you get that? That is not what I was trying to say at all. That is not what I meant. You say, well, Brother Robert, how do you know these things? Well, all you have to do is go back and study the original documents and the documents that we can tell from how people lived and what they believed. Doctrines from the Essenes, doctrines that are the pseudepigraphal writings, and there's so many things I could talk about along that line, which just to catalog them would be, would take ages and ages uh, just to go through it. But nevertheless, this information exists. So we know what people believed for the most part in the Second Temple period. We know what their expectations were, and we know that it was a supernatural worldview. So it was as normal as anything for Paul to say something like the angel or messenger from the Lord stood beside my bed last night or for Peter to get tapped on the side like this and an angel lead him out, okay? Uh, and the doors just opening in front of him. All these supernatural types of things. Even Jesus casting out devils when today we would try to give somebody a medication, okay? These things have to be cleared up so that we can properly see the truth. And that should be our objective, understanding the Word of God without any kind of lens over the top. I remember when uh, it's been probably 20 years ago in my work where I work, there's a particular part that we use in the process of, of imaging that is light sensitive. We have these light sensitive things that, uh, you know, the light can destroy them. So someone came up with an idea and we bought it that if you put these sleeves over the uh, fluorescent lights, then it would protect these um, organic, which we call organic photoconductors. It would, con it would protect them. So we put these sleeves over and we thought, oh, this is a great idea till it turned the whole room yellow. I mean, we couldn't hardly see what we were doing. As a matter of fact, after working there eight hours, 40 hours a week in this room, it started to really do tricks on your mind and all kinds of things. You say, well, what was happening? We had placed something to color the light from which we could see. We had placed a lens over the light. And it was a great lesson to me of how much just one shade, much less four different things, one shade, could cause disruption and trouble. It was so much better when we finally decided, you know, we're going to take them off and whatever the consequences are, we'll find a different way to deal with it, but we're going to have light in this room once again. And it was a great day when we did that. And um, it was getting back to normal. And that's how we have to see the Word of God. And I just want to close with this tonight. There are two basic histories, if you will, that we are dealing with when we talk about the Bible, we talk about man. We're talking about man's history, started in the Garden of Eden, and it leads up into this day. The Bible is not a history book, although it contains history. It is a God's eye view, as one person said, it is a God-selected selection of stories that is meant to tell the story of salvation, what the Germans call, and I'll butcher this word, Heilsgesicht. Okay, salvation history. God has selected these stories, these events, supernatural and natural, to tell a story, to lead us to salvation. Okay, it is the story of salvation. And this is man's history as it is laid out in the Word of God. And then you have on the other side, and I just want to, and this illustration isn't, uh, isn't new with me. This has been used before. Ron Bailey and others have used it. Then we have the history of supernatural beings, okay, like angels, we'll just say loosely. The history of supernatural beings. They have a much, much larger history, I'm sure, than us. And, and there's no telling what their history is like, okay? But only where their history intersects, okay, with our history are we concerned. You see that? I've got this in this little illustration. Man's history overlapping the angel's history is that little segment right there. And that's what the Bible reveals to us. And that's what we're going to talk about. 
I think about C.S. Lewis. He said there are two equal and really opposite errors when it comes to the unseen world, the supernatural. There is, first of all, the extreme of not believing in it at all, not taking the unseen world seriously at all. And then there's the opposite extreme, which is to have an unhealthy interest in these things. And that's what I hope in this in this series, is to strike that balance, to bring an awareness of what we are dealing with. God wants us to know what we're dealing with. He doesn't want us to, as one person said, see a demon behind every tree, because I don't believe that's the case. But there are definitely demonic forces that need to be dealt with. There are doctrines of devils that we have to deal with. There are principalities and powers and rulers and of darkness in the heavenly realms that we have to deal with. So this is a very, very real situation that we're dealing with. And it's my hope over the next four weeks that we can uh, really dig in and talk about these things. Not on a superficial level. We're going to try to dig in and look at this at a little more of a scholarly level over the next few weeks. So I hope that you'll join in. Let's just pray tonight. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to gather together. We're grateful that you have given us just enough information, Lord. You give information in this regard on an as-needed basis. But Lord, you've given us what we need. Lord, the, the Bible is a supernatural book about a supernatural people and a supernatural God in a supernatural world. And Lord, I just pray tonight that you would begin to show us even now, all the areas where we have colored these truths, Lord, all of the lenses to pull them back during these next several weeks so we can just focus on what does the Word of God say? What did it mean to the people who heard it to begin with? How would they have understood it? Lord, help us to see these things. Help us to share these things. And Lord, let them be a light that lights our path. Lord, and guides us through this darkened world. And we ask it in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week, Lord willing. God bless you and have a great evening.